So Comic Cat 102 was just last weekend and judging by the trend of the type of videos on this channel, I would say that there is a very high likelihood that I was there. And if you were thinking that due to the fact that a typhoon was on the way to Tokyo at the time that in order to brace for it they would have cancelled the event or fewer people would have attended, you clearly haven't learned enough about Japanese weeps and their willingness to die for the smart. If any of them were able to have children, many of them would probably have just sacrificed their firstborn to be ahead in the queue. So we're talking about people who, as a result, ended up going in spite of the torrential rains. And so wanting to keep in tradition with the types of videos I want to make for Comic Cat, I figured this time we could also talk about the big interesting things that happened during the event. So no, this video is not going to be me explaining the entirety of the event and what you can find there, but more of me talking about the interesting things that happened and then maybe showing some of the interesting stuff I got at the end. So we'll look at the big picture first and then the small picture. The reason why I don't really want to introduce this event is because of the fact that I feel that at this point, this is one of those events where most people who are very into anime would probably know about already due to the fact that it is referenced a lot in many different animes. For those of you who don't, don't worry, you'll know soon enough. Because either way, even if you didn't know about it before, you're giving me a perfect segue to give a quick summary of the event itself. So needless to say, for those who have watched my past videos or for those who already know what the event is, this is going to be the most boring part of the video. I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but to keep you guys entertained, I have here with me a very special guest. This is... The Koi Man of Despair. Yeah, I don't know why I have this. That, that, that cake though. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place him in my hand standing like this. You guys can stare at him slowly wobble in my very shaky hand. While I quickly summarize the event. So Komi Cat is the biggest anime doujin event in Japan. With doujin being the term used to refer to anything that is indie made instead. So everything from just artwork to games to books on just military analysis. Like I believe I saw someone make a book about just analyzing the war in Ukraine as well. As well as trains, basically anything that a person can be passionate about, you can go there and sell a book on it or anything on it and hopefully meet like-minded people. That is the original base of the uh, entire event, although the large majority of it is anime-based. So for the majority of this video, for those of you who don't know about the event, I'll be showing clips of it as well while I speak. So. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what the event looks like and for those who are already aware of the event, it'll give you a sense of what this year's event was like in comparison. But yes, before the pandemic, the event was really massive. I think at its peak, it was hitting 580,000 visitors over three days, so an average of 190,000 people a day. The queue situation and the number of people being packed into the halls back then, the situation was probably as bad as what Anime Expo in the US was after the pandemic. So you can probably get a sense of what it is like from that if it's a good reference for you. But otherwise, let's just say that if you were to spit in the hall, you had a 0% chance of your spit hitting the ground no matter where you tried to do it from back in the day. But nowadays, due to the fact that the pandemic restrictions were in place and the fact that they have been slowly reducing those, the number of people has been steadily increasing once again. As in when you compare it back to Comic Cat 99, which happened after the pandemic, as compared to this one, I believe that there's a full 80,000 more people visiting the event overall. So steady increase there. And the event has been slowly trying to regain its footing after the pandemic. That's it. When I summarize Comic Cat 101, I feel like a large part of the funny things that happen, like the artist for Bochi the Rock getting sent outside the hall because they gave her a bad placement where the queues would be too massive for the hall to handle and stuff like that. A lot of the issues or the funny things I pointed out were all largely due to the fact that logistics weren't really there yet. There were a lot of things that they were still trying to adjust to after the pandemic since 101 was the first time that people from overseas could even visit the event. But even back then, the event or the country as well wasn't fully open to the public yet. So there was a lot of growing pains to adapt to the war as it is now. And 102, which is the one that happened this time, in a sense, you don't have many of these logistical issues anymore. In fact, I would say this is the Comic Cat of many firsts. Because many things were either happening for the first time in the event's history or in the history of the event after the pandemic. 
because, for example, one of the things that happened after the pandemic was the fact that the event had to restrict the number of people who could attend every single time it was held. But this was the first time after that which they could just accept everyone who wanted to attend. So, granted, due to the fact that they had to charge for entry, fewer people were attending, but all those who wanted to buy a ticket even could ensure that they could get it, and that was quite a joyous occasion. On top of that, this was the first time that they actually didn't botch up the entire ticketing system. I think I mentioned in the video on Comicat 101 as well about the person who had to drive four hours through a blizzard, mind you, to get his ticket and how the early tickets for the earlier access were not properly made accessible for people outside of Japan, which kind of bred this level of inequality. Many issues with how the tickets for foreigners were for a later time period for, than for everyone else, but this time they actually managed to do it pretty well. Like the early tickets are actually equally available to people outside of Japan, and I mean it, because like I live in Japan, hey, I couldn't get the ticket when I applied for it, but my friend who came from overseas, he got it. So surely that means that at the very least, they are not just giving it out to the locals first. I mean, it's an anecdotal thing, so who knows. Though on the topic of tickets for the event, since it felt like I remember seeing a video somewhere of like some thumbnail where some guy was clickbaiting the fact that the tickets cost 5,000 yen for entry or something, that's only true for the early tickets. If you tried to enter in the morning period or the afternoon tickets, it cost about a thousand yen or 500 yen respectively. So at the cheapest, if you really wanted to go there for just a casual experience of what walking through the halls are like and to just explore the place in general, you only really had to pay 500 yen, which is less than five USD. And if you wanted to go in the morning period, which is the period after the early and before the afternoon slots, it costs a thousand yen, which is still under 10 USD, so the entry costs are about the same, if not more affordable, especially for the afternoon slot. And if you're one of those tryhards who's gonna go like, eh, but if you didn't buy the early tickets, you can't get everything that you want. Mm. Hey, hey, I mean, I did think the same thing as well, so I shouldn't be making fun of you for saying that, but it would seem that the situation isn't actually that bad. I went in in the morning ticket slot instead, I got there at 8 a.m., I entered the hall at 11 a.m., and I managed to get everything I wanted, so I would say that it's quite a big dub. Like one of the things I wanted was for a circle that was pretty popular, and I think they only had a thousand copies of it available, and I still got it with time to spare to get everything else. So I would say that the event actually is a lot lighter on the queues. I mean, just look at the event hall itself. The fact that I can see the floor, and if I so wanted to, I could just like dolphin dive onto it and face plant and just piss on the floor and everyone would still have enough space to avoid the fact that I was becoming a complete mental breakdown in the middle of the hall. It's a very weird thing to be imagining, but it also does so imply that there is a lot more space. There are a lot fewer people coming at this specific early period, even for the morning entry period. And so you are a lot likely to get the stuff that you want as a result. In fact, many of the popular circles that used to sell out within the first hour only really sold out around 1.30 to 2, so there is a much bigger gap for you to get the stuff that you want due to the fact that we are still at half the number of total entrants to the event compared to pre-pandemic. There were actually a lot more issues with scalping, I think I saw as well. Like one of the big things I saw that kind of left an impact on me was a bunch of scalpers who bought 12 packs of a limited edition thing from one of the circles that were relatively popular. And then they were just bragging about it as they went around scalping other areas as well. But one interesting thing I saw, which I think this was also the first time I saw a circle do this, was the fact that one of the circles actually tried to restrict the amount of items that people could buy. And not in the usual way of like, you can only buy once per person, which allowed people to go back to the back of the queue and requeue again. But, and this was for a circle called Dragon Kitchen, which if you are under the age of 18, don't lock them up, please. What they did was that they split the stuff that they sold on Comicat into two segments. So the first segment of stuff was the stuff that anyone could buy, and then they had the limited edition stuff, which only people who were subscribed to their fan box, even on the lowest tier, could pay for. And this essentially allowed them to ensure that people were not rapidly trying to buy out the limited stuff due to the fact that they could just check the cards and ensure that the people who were buying the stuff were not showing them the same name on the cards again and again. Now, needless to say, that's not the best solution either due to the fact that in doing so, 
one, it means that they need to spend more time checking stuff during the event so the queues will slow down. And on top of that, there's also the fact that this means that stuff might be inaccessible to some people as well. Arguably, the people who don't have as easy access to like online transaction methods for some reason might not be able to then buy the stuff that they could have otherwise gotten in cash. But hopefully this is a step towards just more circles in general trying to figure out ways to prevent scalping, which would be great for every one of us. Though aside from the torrential rains on the second day, the first day wasn't really much better because the first day was actually the first time that Comicat had actually experienced weather this hot. I believe it was at up till 35 degrees, which some of you in certain parts of the world might be looking at this and going like, Patui! 35 is hot? Bitch, we live in hellfire over here. We burn every day. You ain't got shit, you pussy. And hey, hey, I get you, but I would sooner be a pussy than sit outside for 8 hours in like 43 degree temperature. So I'll, I'll take my 35 as already being very hot. Thank you very much. But perhaps it's due to the fact that this was the first time that temperatures were expected to get this high that we also see for the first time them setting up places for people to rest during the event. And I mean this in multiple ways, because not only was there a corporate booth set up by Pixiv, but the Comicat committee also set up a paid rest area in one of the reception halls that they had rented out, specifically to use as a rest zone. The fact that it's being monetized like this is a bit of an eh, but at the very least, they did start to set up rest zones, which was something I feel like with how rushed and packed Comicat used to be, this is something that probably should have been done earlier. It's nice to see now, especially since the temperatures are getting higher with each passing year. And so hopefully we might see more expansions to this in a way that doesn't take space away from the event itself. Also, in spite of the fact that the event has gone from three days to two days and there has been obviously a decrease in number of circles that can attend, they still did leave aside a decent amount of space for non-anime related doujin stuff as well, which for some, this might seem like less of a good thing. Personally, I enjoy it due to the fact that I like going to these events and finding weird stuff and talking to the creators of the stuff that are being made there. So personally, for me, this was a good thing that they actually kept all of this in. So all of your military nerds, your trained nerds, as well as people who just went there to make like accessories and interesting stuff like miniatures like this, strange mini tatami mats, as well as whatever this clockwork thing is, these people still have a space and it's still fairly big. So the fact that every group is still being represented and that the spirit of Comicat as an overall thing for people to come together for the things they love is still being maintained is something that, in my opinion, is a great thing to see, especially since I don't recall these groups being given as much airtime in the previous Comicat. So, yay! So the last big interesting thing I wanted to talk about, and I left this thing till the very end because I feel like this is the thing that the most number of people will be the most interested in. So, uh, ha uh, ha ha, you guys have been made to watch to this point to see this. I, I don't know. It's the genres as well as series that happen to have the most number of circles making content for it. And I did this calculation all on my own because there isn't actually an official stat put out for this. They do have stats for the overall number of circles in the event but not for each individual one so I had to do my own a little bit of rough math looking at the catalogs for both days and the list is kind of like this so the way I did the calculation you can stare at the list in the meantime and sort over my being wrong if you want to the way I did the calculation is by calculating the total number of booths or well non-wall circles that are in each of these individual categories and then just doing the rough math. So needless to say, some circles might say they're going to do one thing or they might have a banner with one character and then do another thing and stuff like that. So it's very hard to ascertain that 100% everyone is doing what they say they're doing. But typically the way Comicat does the arrangement of circles is they arrange them by what are called shimas or islands. So circles that make the same series or genre of content will be lumped together. If you make a doujin game, you'll be lumped together with other people that make a doujin game. If you make love life smart, you'll be put together with other people making love life fanfiction. So I just counted according to that. Now needless to say, there will always be a small number of people who are 
isolated away from the rest. Like there's this day with like a general section where this is a smattering of all the different groups as well. For the groups that were already decently big in terms of the number of circles attending, I just calculated the number of people that were within this smattering and just added it to the island. So these numbers would probably be more or less accurate plus minus 20 because some circles really don't make it easy to know what they are actually selling on the day and I could be mistaken. But even then, I would say that the numbers and the rankings are pretty clear. At the top, you just have VTubers in general. Like, the way that they put it in the Comic Cat catalog as well is just that all VTuber content is put in the same section. It's just that the section is split into multiple subsections for each individual group. So if you're into Hollow Life, that probably is a separate section for that. But if you take that one out of the picture, then the top is just Blue Archive by a fairly big margin. Like, it... I, I, I wasn't even being biased, okay? I, I know I just made a video about Blue Archive before this. You might be thinking, eh, this guy's biased. It's just like inflating the numbers to make Blue Archive look big. Far from it. I actually tried my best to reduce the number for Blue Archive. Like, every time there was any time that there would be a doubt whether or not the circle was actually making Blue Archive content, I made sure to remove that and put it into the other instead. So, if anything, I've been intentionally biased against Blue Archive for the purposes of this calculation and even then this is the number that it arrived at and hey if you can't take my word for it you could just take the words from the interviewers or some of the circles that were around the area as well because the thing is for the wall circles that are at the edges of the event hall they typically aren't bound to this shima island rule because they're just super popular circles and they're given the wall for the extra space for people to queue and for those that were around the blue archive area and who weren't into Blue Archive or who didn't do stuff with Blue Archive, they were also reportedly quite shocked by the amount of popularity the series had. And supposedly the series also led to an increase in the number of visitors from Korea, which is pretty cool to see as well. I think the developer of Blue Archive himself was actually down as well and he was actually queuing for the circle for the artist of Bochi the Rock this time. So yeah, that's pretty interesting to see. Akamatsu Ken did have a circle as well this time. The ex mangaka who drew Nagima, who turned politician now, has also turned up this time to sell his dim book. Not R18, I guess it makes more sense that way. I don't think he wants to get cancelled out of the political system anytime too soon. But it's cool to see that he's still turning up every single one of these events. For those of you who do not know, Akamatsu Ken is one of the few politicians within Japan, especially because of the fact that he comes from the anime industry itself, who's trying to push for the industry to be able to maintain the independence it has to create the type of content it has till now and to try to fight against the amount of restrictions that the government has long been trying to put on this form of media so just a bit of a tidbit I'm not saying to support him or anything you can go look at his own manifesto for what he wants to do with his time there and decide for yourself but yeah this guy was also selling thin books at Comicat, so that was an interesting thing to see. But yeah, that about sums it up for all the overarching interesting stuff I saw at the event itself. As for my thoughts on the event, I quite like the fact that they actually improved the queuing situation all this much up to now. Like, in spite of the fact that it's free entry for the morning people in the sense that there is no longer a numbered bracket for each group, like you have come at like 6am or 7am, they don't do that kind of bracketing anymore. But even in spite of that, Coming at 8 a.m. and being able to enter by 11 a.m., which means about an hour after the early group has entered, is not too bad, especially when you consider the fact that they have staggered it such that the early group is not as big as the overnight crew used to be, and the morning group that enters after them is a bit more staggered in its entry, so everyone is able to enter and more or less get the stuff that they want without having to slaughter themselves over coming way earlier in the day. Though as to things I'm a little worried about, there's the fact that they started to change the way that circles could book the spaces within the event. So this time around, they actually allowed them to book on multiple days. And I do recall seeing some circles book on day one and two. And there were also some circles that booked the entire table. So slots one and two instead of the table being split between two circles. So that makes it feel like the number of circles did decrease overall. And there's also the fact that they are reducing the price to book circles for the next time around, which is actually fantastic. Like, hearing that circles can spend less, because now it costs around 12,000 yen, and I think it's going down to 8,000. It's a lot of money, especially for the smaller fan circles for whom 
just covering that cost might be difficult and they just want to go there to set up a booth to make friends and all that. So the fact that it's going down is great, but it also does make it feel like there's less of a demand, hence why they're lowering the supply price. And there's also the fact that the corporate booths just don't feel like they have the same level of oomph that they used to anymore. Like, I get the feeling that this might be due to the fact that after the pandemic, fewer people have been going for those, so many decided to just pull out because they realized that they weren't earning money at the time and they were worried about losing more since this booths for corporate are quite expensive. But I remember, like, and I'm going to sound like a boomer for saying this, but, the, like, back in the day, the visual novel corporations, they used to even go to Comic Cat and sell or announce their game for the first time, and they would just hype it up with a lot more flair at the event itself. But nowadays, there just isn't that anymore. And on top of that, groups like Cospa, which are there selling just general anime goods, taking up more and more of the space, which just gives it less of a hype feeling. I, I don't know, it might just be me, but... And then there's also the fact that like Pixiv went there and set up a resting area, which don't get me wrong, having more resting areas with how bad the weather was this time is wonderful. Like I'm glad they did that, but at the same time, it does make it feel like the fact that they had to take out a corporate booth to do this, it does kind of feel like there just isn't much that other groups want to or other corporations want to put up to display anymore. There are people coming by the first train again. It's also kind of worrying due to the fact that if people are coming by the first train, this means that eventually we might see across the years a reversion to more people coming by the first train and then overnight being an issue again. But hopefully we don't get to that point. We'll have to see for now. But yeah, it's nothing major. Anyway, let's just talk about some of the stuff I found that I personally found quite interesting there. First up, this one was kind of funny and a bit anime related as well. Like there was a circle that was selling this. It's like a psychedelic bochi shirt, but more so than the fact that the shirt was like some psychedelic meme thing is the fact that they actually sold their music as well and I bought it and uh... You know, I, I might be old, right? I still want a CD space in my PC, mostly because most Japanese bands make their music on CDs, but uh... Yeah, this is a little too much even for me. And I also got this, which, no, this is not a visual novel. Well, I mean, it kind of is one, but it's not an r written one. What this is, is it's a parody-ish game thing made by the creators of Needy Go Overdose for the series at the event itself. So the thing is that because they're indie, they didn't rent out a corporate space. Instead, they rented out a Dojin Circle space as well. And they were selling a thousand copies of this. Then I also bought this four set of Dojins, which in spite of the cover looking like this, it's not really meant to turn anyone on really, unless you're really into getting turned on by Linux itself. Because yeah, this is apparently just largely a set of books written by the Dojin Circle, which was just very interested in getting people into Linux. So they explain a lot about how to use it as well as their own misadventures with using it. So it's a lot of text and not much cool. I don't know, maybe there are actually people out there who will read about this person's misadventures trying to get Puppy Linux, which is a Linux OS, workable with the Japanese language and go like, oh yes, give me more, give me that Ubuntu. Oh. I don't know, maybe there are people out there like that. Also, I figured I might as well just mention it since for people who've never been to Comic Cat before, they may not know this as well, but any Dojin artists that you follow in general, for those of them that do go to Comic Cat, especially for the big or popular ones, they might actually sell a item set instead of just a book. Which usually if you go to Melon Books or you buy online, you would only be able to buy the specific book. But like for this series, you, you don't need to know the name, it's fine. They actually do sell stuff like it comes with the bag and then the bag just has a bunch of other stuff like acrylic keychains, files, so on and so forth. And does tend to be Comic Cat specific but yes that's all i have for you guys today hopefully this video was interesting ah uh, one thing i didn't mention so far is that i actually did catch covid at comic cat itself they stopped all the covid checks as well so i guess like someone who was infected actually did turn up so hey as proof like here here's here's the japanese covid medicine that there, there, there you go Aside from the fact that I'm slightly coughing up blood in my phlegm right now, I'm doing quite fine. So no, no need to worry, I'm mostly fine. Next month, I'll be coming back with more videos on the game industry and gaming stuff as well. Since I don't, there's going to be a bit of a lull in terms of events. So I'll be focusing on that for a little bit. Then when I start going for events again, I'll be talking about those as well. 
But until then, thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Give this a like and subscribe if you do. Hopefully, I have a Discord if you're interested in that. And I'll see you, hopefully, in the next video. And until then, take care and bye-bye.